Most of the time, when you watch a horror movie, you do just that. You watch. When you finish a movie like It Follows, which is acclaimed for some of its striking visuals, your mind can't help but to linger on its most chilling scenes. When you read a manga by Junji Ito, you're often left haunted by the final panels. When you watch 2018 Slender Man, well, you won't get much, but the other two are scary. But with the rise in popularity of analog horror, more and more creators have been coming to understand that strong visuals, while important, aren't the only avenue to fear. Series like the Mandela Catalog, Kane Pixel's Backroom series, and Local 58 explore new ways to generate terror in visual formats. In December of last year, Analog Horror made its way onto the big screen with the release of Skinamarink, directed by Kyle Edward Ball. If you're unfamiliar, it's an experimental film focusing on two children. One night, they wake up to discover that their parents are missing and that all the external doors and windows to their house have vanished. They are trapped inside all alone. At least, that's how it first seems. It quickly becomes obvious that something with evil intentions is lurking in the darkness. Throughout the movie, we see Kyle and Kaylee retreat to the hospitable glow of an old tube TV, their only comfort left in their otherwise pitch-black prison. The film has its fair share of controversy, with some calling it a modern masterpiece and others calling it pretentious garbage, but I personally think that there's something special about Skinamarink. It reminds me of an important lesson about storytelling through film. It's easy to forget that film is not just a series of images, it's an audiovisual medium. The sound design in a movie is not a secondary piece of media that accompanies what's on screen. What we hear contextualizes our experience of the film and provides constant emotional information, even when there's no sound at all. Keep in mind, I'm not just talking about music. There's a whole host of audio work going on behind the scenes that you probably never even notice, and that's a good thing. Sound design's there to enhance the experience of watching a movie in a way that's subtle but meaningful. Whether it be through sound effects or dialogue, good audio work seeks to elevate, not distract. So how does today's film do this? Well, for Skinamarink, audio isn't just an elevation of the story. It is the story. It's obvious when you watch Skinamarink that the visuals can be, uh, let's say, de-emphasized. It's clear that that's an intentional choice, but in my first experience with the movie, I wasn't sure what the intention actually was. Many shots are out of focus, off-center, or simply too dark. As I reviewed these shots over and over again, my mind subconsciously fell back to my hearing whenever my vision failed. When you start to pay attention to sounds, the first thing you'll notice is that Skinamarink uses static a lot. It'd be really easy to chalk this up to an aesthetic choice to make the movie feel analog, but that's a shallow assessment of the role static plays in the movie. Static conveys warmth, contrasting the cold blue lighting that we see in most visuals, particularly the ones that are intended to be the most frightening. Warmth is used in Skinamarink to symbolize security, while these cool tones symbolize fear and the unnatural. This relates back to one of the movie's primary themes, the perversion of security. Most of the story is focused on the intersection of fear, security, and the desperate fight for peace when all hope of understanding is gone. What I want to emphasize is that the film does not pursue this theme through visuals alone. It injects fear into every shuffle and bump by making it impossible to tell what sounds are incidental and which sounds are the monster. This is the most important idea in visual horror, and you've probably heard it before. It's called the Uncanny Valley. In its most basic terms, the uncanny valley is a theory that states that we find comfort in clarity. Things that are clearly dangerous or things that are clearly safe are easy to categorize, and we've gotten pretty good at doing so. Humans? That's safe. Lion? That's dangerous. But if you put them together, you end up with this. Our instincts have no idea what the heck that is, so we just feel creeped out. At best, uh, we can tell something's wrong with it. In his 2009 paper, The Audio Uncanny Valley, Sound, Fear, and the Horror Game, Mike Grimshaw from the University of Bolton discusses the idea of an auditory equivalent to the Uncanny Valley. I would argue that Skinamarink is the best intentional use of this effect in analog horror. Let's look at a few highlights from the paper. First, Grimshaw claims that an oral resolution that is lower than a high-quality human-like visual resolution might lead to the uncanny. 
Low-quality audio recordings sound less human while still retaining the seed of familiarity that makes it uncanny. Obviously, Kyle Edward Ball wanted to emphasize this in Skinamarink, partially as a way to create an authentic atmosphere for the movie setting in 1995. In an interview, Kyle says he wanted the audio to feel like an old, scratched-up retaping of a film that wasn't preserved from the 70s. Lots of hiss, lots of hum. That may have been directed primarily towards authenticity, but the result is a soundscape that's far more uncanny and unsettling than a pristine recording. It's a subtle effect, but like I said, that's what good sound design is all about. Another point from Grimshaw's paper is this. Uncertainty about the location of a sound source, its cause, or its meaning in the virtual world increases the fear emotion. When we watch Skinamarink, we hardly ever know the source of the sounds that we're hearing. The best examples of this are in the scenes in which we actually hear the monster speaking to the children. It's never clear what source it's emanating from, and we never really know what any of it means. The first scene that pops into my head is, of course, the look under the bed scene. This was one of the most effective scenes in the whole movie for me because we just don't have any idea what the meaning of what's being said is. There seems to be no reason for the command, so it's able to generate an intense fear response as Kaylee complies. Finally, Grimshaw says that these specific frequencies in a sound can lead to a negative effect on the listener. In Skinamarink, dialogue is never included without heavy editing. Different frequencies are boosted for different characters to create an immediate emotional response whenever you hear a voice. The children's voices are edited to boost low-end frequencies, which are associated with warmth. On the other end of the spectrum, the voices of the parents and the monster are boosted in the high end, giving them a cold and metallic tone. I really want to lean into this point because it's the one that most strongly relates to the themes of Skinamarink. This is a movie about security and danger blending into one and becoming inseparable. Audibly, we can hear that happen as the parents' voices are twisted from the father's warm tones at the start of the movie to the cold, high whispers that emerge once everything has gone wrong. Still, there's nowhere for the children to turn to for aid, and they still try to be with their parents even when there's something obviously wrong. The only adults in the house have ceased to be fully themselves, or even fully human, but there's no other alternative. At the start of this video, I showed you what I believe to be the thesis of Skinamarink. In the dark, even that which once gave you comfort may become a monster. When everything fades into ambiguity, we lose the ability to discern good from evil, friend from foe, and safety from danger. Because we do not rely only on one sense to find security, Skinamarink does not rely on a single method to take that security away. Instead, Kyle Edward Ball uses static in a way that is genius. Static, in Skinamarink, is auditory darkness. It is the obfuscating medium in which all other sounds become uncanny. All else must breach through the static for us to even know it's there. This is the final point I want to make today. Whereas in most movies, the important sounds are mixed so that they stand out from the background, Skinamarink does just the opposite. The important sounds, like dialogue, are all covered in shadow, an effect that is achieved by isolating the frequencies that most nearly blend into the static. All we receive is the barest hint of a line. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night because you thought you heard something in your house? Once your mind is on alert, nothing you hear can ever sound fully safe. You lie in wait and strain your ears to make out anything. Every creak and groan from your house settling is suddenly 
an intruder taking another trespassing step through your home, intentions unknown. I'm sure it's just the house settling. Right? But the hum of electronics or the whir of a fan makes it impossible to tell. If only you had turned it off before bed, then you could hear clearly. But instead, it masks any sound that might warn you of danger. But what about when you already know that something is inside the house? That the danger, if out of sight, is still present? Can you afford to trust your ears then? Of course not. And that's the space that Skinnamarink wants us to be in, both visually and audibly. At no point is the monster not present. It's always there because it lives in every shadow and it lives in the static. The same low static that grants comfort and warmth is also hiding the greatest threat. And when we finally reach the end of the movie, we fully see the monster as it emerges from the shadow. It's bathed in warm light, terror and comfort now married together. Its voice extends from the static. Go to sleep. I'm Chromudgeon. Thanks for watching.